84. Class of 84. Class of 84. All right, very good. How does that stack up against our next guest, who is also a Marine, Kent Leonhardt, Ag Commissioner? Kent, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. How are we all doing today? Semper Fi out there, Bill. Semper Fi, brother. <laughs> that is awesome. What year were you, Kent? Uh, let's see. I signed up for Officers Canada School in 74, trained for two summers, and was commissioned in May of 1976. Bicentennial year. Wow. Yeah, yeah. right, and retired in 1996. And uh, a second career, and maybe even a third career as a farmer and an ag commissioner here, too. Yeah, I think I'm on my third career right now. <laughs> <laughs> Will there be a fourth, Kent? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Well, maybe when you're done doing that, you can just sit in here, you can co-host along with me and the Admiral and Mr. Mm -hmm. Kearns. Well, you can invite me down uh, once in a while, and uh, maybe I'll jump in and, and do that with you. I think you need to have that as an open invitation right there. Yeah. Be a bit of a commute, but what the heck. And you can rest oh, assured. You know, there's always, I, I got so many friends in the Eastern Panhandle now from being the Ag Commissioner and friends from the legislature. It, it's an easy trip. That's awesome. Have you been able to make it in for Apple Harvest Festivals or Youth Fairs uh, recently or in the past, Kent? I, I, every year I've been in office, I've crowned the queen. And oh, I've that's done great. the parade much, so it's uh, I'm there every year. We only had the one year off from COVID, I think. That's awesome. Bill, you were about to say? No, I was going to say, if you were able to join us, Kent, you can. I can rest assured you would improve the intellectual quotient quite a bit here. <laughs> <laughs> the, no Rob, no Rob's no struggling with a co-host. No 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 <laughs> Scraping the bottom of the barrel, Scraping Bill. the bottom of the barrel. That's right. I got Maybe Bill. that's why he called me this week or over the weekend. I got Bill to the power of two here this morning. What are you talking about? Kent, you've got, you were challenged in the primary, which is nothing new for you. You've been challenged in the past, and you have a challenger yes. who we had on yesterday, Deborah Stiles. Uh, for the uh, general election, which is in November. Uh, have you had an opportunity to set up any debates with uh, Deborah Stiles for this uh, election coming up? Uh, no, but I'm sure there'll be some forums out there that, that come up where we'll both be present, and so the public will get a chance to see the uh, the difference between the two of us. You know, I, you know she made a comment that uh, she felt everybody had... Uh, should have a choice and you know i can't disagree with that i think uh that's absolutely true and i hope everybody goes out and votes but i hope when they go vote they actually look at the records of the individuals that they're voting for it doesn't matter what party but people should be looking at uh the records and not just voting location or just voting by party kent before we get into records and that sort of thing uh we obviously had a lot of rain over the last week but before that uh, much of the eastern panhandle and uh, the state, uh, we're in drought conditions here. Uh, what is the latest report for you that you're hearing about farmers, crops this year, and uh, how much the rain helped or, or not enough? Well, the rain the rain was a start. The rain did not make up the entire deficit of the uh, of the water uh, that that we've missed. And of course, once you have crop damage and crop loss, you never really truly make all that up. But what we can do is we can do the best we can to mitigate the damage and then make sure uh, we help out going forward. And uh, just uh, yesterday, the Farm Service Agency really started taking applications for the programs that I've been working on with uh, Director Purdue uh, ever since we, we got into this drought. Now, there's going to be a new drought monitor map coming out on Thursday. The data for that ends today. We'll see where it is. Uh, your area was in the D3, which is the worst, where most of the help will come from. Uh, I fear that some of our other counties that did not get a lot of the rain that you all got, they're going to enter into uh, D3 as well. So the extent of the drought might expand. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Kent, let me go back a couple, three or four years in, in, in time. Uh, stink bugs manifestation. Uh, we had a, they were really hurting the apple crops here. Uh, the, the stink bugs are not as prevalent as they were, uh, but the corrective action taken, I believe. And are there other insects that we have to look out for that's going to give the same problem that stink bugs gave? Well, we're actually working on the... Uh... Uh, very heavily, and we actually hired a full-time spotter lanternfly coordinator. Uh, you know, your eastern panhandle was hit had very heavily with that. 
the threat of that is primarily to the uh, to the grapes. Um, farmers are working uh, our grape our orchards and our grapevine our vineyards are working to uh, mitigate that uh, the best they can. We've had a lot of discussions. We're also working on reducing the tree heaven uh, plants, which are the uh, host to that uh, insect. Another invasive species brought over from the same region. Uh, they just happen to come up a number of years early, get established, and the bug comes in, and you got a perfect storm. And uh, we've been working very closely with uh, USDA Animal Plant Health uh, Inspection Service. Uh, we've gotten some funding. That's what allowed me to hire the full-time spotted lantern fly coordinator. We're doing a lot of advertising. You know, we're putting on videos called Smash It, Get Rid of the, uh, if you see the, see it, it's a beautiful insect, uh, but it does need to be destroyed uh, so it doesn't create more havoc. And mm-hmm. what we're noticing is it's not as bad as we originally thought it could be, but it's not good. Uh, it blooms and blossoms and it dies down and blooms and blossoms and it dies down. You, and you, of course, we're still on the, uh, what used to be the gypsy moth, it's now yeah. called the spongy moth. We're still doing the slow the spread work, uh, and those were the ones that really went after our oak trees. Yeah, you mentioned a tree of heaven. I uh, I have several on my property, and I've discovered that you cannot just cut them down. You have to kill them first because if you cut them down, then there's going to be dozens and dozens of shoots that come up in the place. So, oh, no kidding. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. So, Bill, yeah, are you seeing a lot of spotted lanternflies yeah. at oh, your house? It, it, not as bad this year as last year. Literally, you felt walking some of the lanes through the woods. You were walking on a floating carpet. There would be that thick. Good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, Kent, let's uh, talk about you as the ag commissioner now, and sure. uh, why you That'd feel why you feel you deserve another term. Well, we want one more term at least, and uh, that's probably going to be my last, folks. And I've been pretty. Uh, pretty uh, upfront about that uh, because what you're seeing, we want to keep the policies that we have in place and keep moving things forward. Uh, you know, I uh, when you look at what we've accomplished so far, um, and we got to set the record straight on a couple of items uh, from yesterday, but, you know, farmers markets have tripled since I've been the commissioner of agriculture. We have wholesale uh, sales to uh, retail outlets, is up over 50%. Red meat production is up over 50% in the state. We're doing everything we can to close that gap from where our food is produced uh, to where it's consumed. We know that type of food is healthier for the citizen. We know it's safer. Uh, We know it's better for the state's economy. And we also know it's good for the environment because you're not having to transport and use fossil fuels to move that food across. Uh, we've done so much. I've asked the legislature for assistance in what we call our West Virginia Grown Program. <clears throat> Every year since I've been in office, we haven't gotten any help yet. But we've done all that with that. And I just keep saying, what could we do if we were, if we had a little bit of help to where we could get that more of that marketing out and things of that nature? So, and we're working with your delegate Wayne Clark to, uh, you know, even improve on the things we've done for the wineries. We've made it easier for wineries to sample at fairs and festivals and get their product out into the public. Uh, we've worked with the alcohol ABC at, uh, under the governor's uh, 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 purview, and uh, we've made uh, great strides uh, there as well. So uh, stand by for more. We're going to be continuing to work on the wine industry uh, as well. Uh, so I could go on and on. We've just done so many things. We've streamlined regulations. Uh, we've changed the attitude in the Department of Ag from a regulatory agency to uh, educate before regulate. And I know people keep like to talk about uh, overregulation and everything else, uh, and that's an easy campaign thing to do. But, you know, as you folks know, I started my farm from scratch. And I bought an abandoned farm in 1982 when I was a young captain, and I started working it hard in 96 when I retired. And we grew it from 205 acres to 380 acres. We were successful. And I don't ever remember having a regulator come onto my farm. <laughs> I don't remember a regulation that held me back. So 
A lot yeah. of the regulations are deal, and you mentioned it yesterday, deal with uh, food safety. Yes. And, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you want to make sh- you expect that food, when you take it off the shelf, to be healthy and safe. And speaking of food safety, Bill Kearns, of course, executive director of the Berkeley County Health Department. Do you work hand in hand with the agricultural department at all, Bill? Um, yeah, it's in in so far um, as far as public health goes across the state, environmental health would be the main agency that would work with the Department of Ag, and, and certainly we we've done that and and worked with the rules and i agree that the um move removing a lot of those restrictions it's helped um the having the farmers markets and and allowing the farmers markets to provide um uh, home-baked goods um shelf stable goods and things of that nature only only helps the economy it helps the community and um so definitely we work well together um and yeah there's some restrictions that get put in place, but many of those have been removed. And I think that's a, a good credit to Kent and, um, and his crew of what they've done. Um, but they work with the, they work with the health department and trying to get, get things done safely, but done more easily. So yeah. yeah, Bill, you and I worked very closely together during the pandemic Oh yes, to make sure we could keep the uh, agricultural industries open in the state of West Virginia, because, you know, there was people that wanted to shut everything down. And uh, we wanted to make sure we disrupted the food supply chain as minimum. You know, Bill and I had the same philosophy, and we worked together very closely to make sure we could keep those things open. And I think one of the the parts, is, uh, Kent, that you had mentioned a while ago about the distilleries, and and yes, that is um, it's great to be able to remove a lot of those restrictions so we can have that happen. Um, some people think that you know um, well, we can do everything; um, everything's exempt for those. Well, not everything is, but as far as removing the in, the ABC restriction, the, the a lot of the having to have those food permits and for a fair and festival, um, so they can have wine tastings and things. I think that's I think that was a great. Move on your all's part well thank you appreciate that kent looking at the farming community in total all the all the various elements uh there's a lot of pressure on the eastern panhandle with uh with development that's squeezing farmers out but state as a whole how would you grade the health of the agriculture or the farming community well um i would grade us we're doing extremely well um now this drought's going to set us back a little bit but I know the West Virginia agriculture community is going to rebound from that. But when you look at uh, some of the food manufacturing we've uh, increased in the state, Mountaintop Beverage, for example, the aseptic uh, beverage processing plant in Morgantown employing close to 300 people already, and they could get up to 700 and filling the gap when Milan left West Virginia. Uh, they're hiring some of the same people. Uh, back and doing that. So that's a great success. We've got more uh, meat processing facilities coming online. I'd love to get another one out there uh, your direction. We just got to get somebody willing to invest in it. Uh, The apples, uh, we've had issues with the apples last year where the processors are taking in concentrate instead of using the fresh apples. And some of that concentrate is is foreign uh, originated. I actually had discussed, I'm at the state fair here and uh, some trade representatives from the White House came in yesterday, and my staff and I got to later meet with some of those uh, those individuals and discuss those things that are affecting uh, trade and uh, the agricultural commodities in the state of West Virginia, particularly our, our fruit orchards. And I think they listened and they heard, and they're going to take some of those suggestions back. Um, the other thing that would help – uh, us and I talked about it, and I've talked to every one of our representatives in the Senate and, and the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, why can't a state inspected meat facility sell across state lines? Uh, USDA. USDA comes in and inspects my inspection program. I've got a cooperative agreement with the USDA on meat inspection, and I have 30 years saying we're equivalent but we still can't sell across state lines. Uh, I've been working on that since from day one since I've been in office. I think we're getting closer and closer to having uh, that problem fixed, but we're still not there. Uh, government takes a long time, particularly at the federal level. Uh, but, but the message is being heard, and I have had access to uh, the individuals to have those discussions. I've talked to the uh, 
chair of the House Ag uh, Committee on this issue as well. In West Virginia, uh, are there any emerging non-traditional farming niches that we're going to see more of in the future? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I've always said that we could be a cornucopia of specialty crops, and we do have a specialty crop, crop grant program that we get through the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, it's not a lot of money. It's about $287,000 a year, but we award different types of grants. And what you're seeing, like, for one of them that uh, that's emerging more and more is lavender. Uh, we have an, a, a tremendous... Actually, we now have the largest lavender farm east of the Mississippi, and most of it's on abandoned mine land. And we've been able to repurpose mining lands for lavender, and they're starting to sell uh, all over the country uh, lavender products that uh, help a me, lot of the uh, customers want. Help me out with the, uh, the lavender thing because I was at a winery one day, and they had they were charging money to go into the lavender field. What's the what's the draw? Is there some type of medical benefit to hanging out with lavenders? I'm I'm it's, I'm I'm lost on this one. Help me. Yeah, well, particularly you know, lavender has been uh, is an interesting uh, crop, and it's uh, you know people love the smell of lavender. Number one, uh, being charged to go into the field that's like that's a, that's an agritourism, and we've expanded agritourism uh, in the state of West Virginia with. Some of the agritourism bills, Senator Rucker out there has been sponsoring and a big supporter of agritourism. So we've done some great work there. Uh, and that's what these folks are doing. You get to go walk through a lavender field. Like, didn't the, Be the Beatles have a song out, Lavender Fields Forever or something like that? Strawberry Fields uh, Forever. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Lavender oh, Strawberry. Yeah. Fields, <laughs> Cut up some lavender, put it on your breakfast cereal, Ken, see if you can tell the difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, people do have lavender. There's people out there making, I'm not in the state of West Virginia, but there's lavender milk. You can flavor teas and things with lavender, right. but it's mostly used in lotions and soaps. That's what I thought. It has that good aroma that uh, people seem to be attracted to. What makes lavender uh, conducive to being on abandoned mine, mine fields, mine terrain? It, it can grow in poor soil. You know, these abandoned mine lands, particularly those that were what they used to call mountaintop removal, uh, the soil's turned upside down, and there's, uh, you know, there's... It's uh, it's not as fertile as you know what you're used to there in the eastern Panhandle and the crop area and the Chesapeake Bay region, so uh, it's a it's a very hardy plant that can grow in in poor soils and it's a great way to repurpose. And then the more you grow the lavender in there, that just improves the soil. So it's actually part of the reclamation process of those mine lands. It's a great it's a great win win for everybody. And is, does it require specialized equipment to harvest or large specialized equipment to harvest? No. Unfortunately, it's a hand. <laughs> There's a lot of hand work on oh, that Okay, one. yeah. Uh, you know, when I visited, I actually even on a National Association of State Departments of Ag in New Mexico, I visited a lavender farm uh, just to get some thoughts and ideas, and I brought that back and I shared it with the uh, the, the managers of the uh, lavender farm here in uh in West Virginia, and uh, they uh, it was very interesting uh, to do. They also did a thing with the uh, with honeybees, and uh, you know we're doing a lot with honey right now in the state of West Virginia. But the 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 hertz, the uh, the sound wave of a honeybee hive, apparently is in that range of it that's very therapeutic to people that are stressed i can remember being on active duty and i had beehives at home and i used to turn a white bucket upside down if i had a bad day i'd go sit on that bucket and watch my bees come and go and i thought it was just watching the bees that was making me calm down a little bit and it turns out it was actually the hum of the, the hum of the, uh, of the hives and they use them in uh in that place used it in the beehive uh in like tanning rooms and the bees were on the outside and the people would tan inside and they'd get the the effect of the honey bees at the same time of doing their tanning and they'd be in right near a lavender field and so it was all part of an agritourism thing but it was very therapeutic to folks and commissioner kent leonhardt our guest here on the program ken earlier in the interview you mentioned that you were looking for maybe some more help from the legislature in regards to the agriculture of the state and maybe some agritourism can you give us some examples of what you'd like them to do 
Well, number one is we the, the one of the big priorities is is funding the uh, West Virginia Grown Program. Um, you know, I've had a lot of support for that. It just has never hit uh, hit the final bill uh, in the in the spending of the state. And I think we could grow agriculture even more. Uh, with the right, you know, part of that would be having more planning cores. I've got a planning coordinator in most parts of the state that go out and work with and the farmer and the uh, folks using the foods and bringing that all together. You know, just a simple example, if anybody's been to uh, out your way to Cape and State Park to the farm to table dinner, if you haven't done it, I've done it in the past. The farm to table uh, dinners at the DNR at the state parks is an initiative that I suggested, and we brought uh, their chefs and my team together and started coordinating local foods at the state parks. And it's been a tremendous success. Uh, we've done the same thing with the gift industry and the value added agricultural products, jams, jellies, soaps. And a lot of those are showing up. The West Virginia Grown logo is in our state parks. And some of them even have an actual display of that. So those are the type of things that we've been coordinating with. And just could you imagine if we could just do a little bit more? Because that that is generating income for our agricultural community. And the best way to uh, to save a farm and, for, and to protect farmland is to make it profitable. Uh, Kent, on that on that question, this goes harkens back to something we were talking about earlier. Do you have a sense of how much the agricultural industry has grown, say, in the last 10 to 15, 20 years? Well, I can say in the last five years. I know it was mentioned there was an $800 million agricultural output, but that was that's five-year-old data. The last one that came out in this last uh, past winter from the National Ag Statistics Service uh, is 950 million. I'm hoping we break that one billion in my next term. Uh, so that would be uh, quite an accomplishment. So the the industry is growing in the state. And like I mentioned, farmers markets are up, wholesale sales are up. We've got more vegetable farmers in the state, and those, you know, you can call vegetable farming a specialty crop. Agritourism is growing. Uh, so I think we're overall we're we're very healthy. And another good thing that uh, those statistics that came out from the National Ag Statistics Service is that we now have more young, from five years ago to today, we have more farmers under age 30. We have more farmers with less than five years experience uh, in agriculture. And those are all good signs. If you look at our FFA program, it used to be called Future Farmers of America, but it's just FFA in our schools. In the last few years, we've, like other than the COVID year, we've been breaking records of number of students. We have 7,300 students, and we never broke 7,000 before. We have 7,300 students in FFA right now. Uh, that was last year's school year. I hope, I'm hoping it's even more this coming school year. We actually run the conference center at Cedar Lakes, which is the home of the FFA, and they do their summer conference there. We rent, rent it out for other venues and stuff uh, throughout the year, and the state uses it uh, for many of their conferences and training. But we, having that many young people interested in agriculture, now not all of them will go into an agribusiness or, or farming, but we're getting more and more of our youth are educated in agriculture, and that's only going to be healthy for the agriculture in the state as well. Kent, thanks so much for your time this morning. Best of luck to you in the upcoming election. I'm sure we will talk with you again before November. I hope so. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Indeed, that was sir. a fast, fast <laughs> segment, wasn't it? It always is. It always <laughs> Thanks, Kent, for in Hey, thanks, Bill and Bill. Oh, you're Talk welcome. See you later. Sending you out with the Marine Corps theme here at 9 o'clock.